Well, good morning. Good morning. Not too many people were here at 8, so that was probably good. Everybody, uh, nowadays, you don't have to announce daylight savings time anymore like you used to in the old days because everybody's like cell phones and all the, all the things that you look at regularly update automatically now. But not all the other clocks throughout the house that you overlook. But glad to have you with us this morning. Uh, I'm going to start with the, the one that get the one out of the way that I don't like to put a spotlight on because. It's hard being up here and I'm probably not the best model of I always ask, hey, make sure you share your prayer requests or things we can help with, and then I, I don't always do that myself. So I'll get this out of the way. Um, struggling with some dental work lately, and so it's been ongoing pain and a lack of sleep for me. So usually that won't show up too much when I interact here because God provides a lot of energy and strength. Um, but it uh, is beginning to take a toll on me a little bit mentally and in, in the physical department, and then that spills over to my family as well. So keep me in prayer that way. Uh, that I can get this dental stuff resolved. It's, uh, uh, I don't it's have much hope. It doesn't help right now either. So uh, now well, that's out of the way. Let's focus on all the other things that are, that are great to think about. Um, Pat is with us today. She's in the back there. And so, uh, yeah, <laughs> praise to God for that. Uh, for those who may be visiting, Pat had a pretty serious accident and really only came out of it with a, a back injury that that could have been much worse, and so she's still recovering from that, and that'll be a long recovery, but the fact that she's with us at all, considering the nature of the accident, is a miracle, so we're very thankful for that. Glad that you're with us today, and, and Larry, and glad you brought Larry with you, too, you know, because he's... <laughs> so, th praise the Lord for you guys, and God bless you this morning. Um, and then related to backs, so we have a, a downside one is Mildred is in the Armour Hospital at the moment because her back is uh, fractured and she has quite a bit of uh, pain. She didn't have a fall, or, but she strained her back and it's, it's led to some problems. And uh, so she'll be, she said, I talked to her yesterday and she said she'll be home Monday, family staying with her. <clears throat> and uh, Tuesday she goes to Mitchell for kind of a checkup thing on, on a procedure that she'll have. And, in uh, Sioux Falls in, in the near future. So we want to continue to pray for her, especially for pain relief. And uh, she says she sleeps well right now, though, so that, that at least is a, a Thanksgiving in that. But, um, and it's Mildred, so she's always still in cheerful spirits. So God bless her for that. Uh, but we want to keep her in prayer. Um, and then uh, John England recovering with his knee replacement. He'll have another one of those in the near future. Um, and uh, I'll be praying for Rod Goldhammer and other pastors and such. Uh, um, just to all the work they do to, to help area churches, just so you're aware of that this morning as well. Um, I was able to be in on the uh, Pickero Lake um, uh, board meeting this past week, and uh, now I am technically on the board. I'm a trustee with them now, which it doesn't have a, a ton of responsibility, but it'll keep me in the loop on Pickero Lake. Um, they announced their dates. Their senior high camp for this year is June 18th through 23rd. And their junior high camp is July 16th through 21st. And I'll be the camp pastor that week in July uh, for their junior high campers. So we're looking forward to that again. And uh, uh, I didn't know this until the board meeting, but um, uh, there are member churches that kind of uh, uh, help pray and, and, and help out with the camp in different ways. And, and uh, not much of a, a direct commitment other than prayer and a nominal fee to be uh, a member of the Pickerel Lake Camp Association, you could call it, um, and so I'm considering, uh, I'll, I'll bring that up to the board next month to see if that's something we want to support. I know we have families that have enjoyed that, that camp, it's an AFLC camp that, we, that would be worthwhile for us to support and be a part of, but for now, just keep them in prayer and pray that their uh, summer camps next year go really well. Um, this morning is uh, Reaching the Unreached, the uh, basket will be out, uh, that ministry, for the basket for donating to that will be out this morning downstairs for the fellowship time. 
And uh, also, uh, we'll, we'll sing later, uh, maybe at the end of the service, just for convenience sake. Um, but Trenton is the ripe old age of 30. See, he's not a woman, I can say his age. And so uh, the family is including us in there. Well, he'll be tomorrow, technically, so you know, one day. Um, but uh, the family is having a, a cake celebration with us today, so we get to partake and, and uh, celebrate that that way. Always good to celebrate life. And uh, uh, the, let's see, oh, in the, in the insert for you today, there's um, the nominating committee for the AFLC annual conference asks that we put this in for a couple weeks. Um, it's positions for people to help with the association that we're a part of. And so we, for, for the AFLC, we're not a denomination, we're not a top-down structure, there's no synods, there's no um, you know, bishops or anything like that. It's run by these corporations of just people from the congregations. And for that to run well and efficiently, just like our church council, um, which will be coming up soon as well, people will be looking for their replacements there, are these committees need people to be willing to pray and serve on them. There's not much of a time commitment for them, but they do need people to be active part of them for making decisions and uh, choices for the different ministries, especially thinking of like home missions and, and the Association Retreat Center Board um, and World Missions Boards and stuff like that. Those are very important things. So be thinking of that. If you have questions about that, um, I, you, can, you can talk to me or the, the PISEX or the Libkeys. I know have been a large part of the AFLC conferences in the past and anybody who's visited before. Um, we're, the conference is in Sioux Falls this next June. And so I strongly encourage you, if you're able to, uh, either at least ask about it or see if you can be a part of that. Um, it is a great time. It's like a family reunion, really. It's, it's um, awesome. And then uh, the la last couple things, uh, Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes are available downstairs, and they do need to be returned next Sunday. So if you're uh, thinking of doing that, today would be the day to grab the box and, and work on filling that. And... Um, the uh, Journey Missions, they, they sent one to the WMF. They also sent one to me and the church. Journey Missions is kind of like a short-term missions part of the AFLC. And I'm hoping that John, the, John Nelson, the guy that heads that, I talked to him at the annual conference last year, and, and uh, I believe he's going to, unless his schedule changes, he's going to be um, able to be here and speak to us the Sunday after annual conference, which helps me out as a pastor. Um, but I, I appreciate John, and I'm, I want him to be able to share. Journey Missions is pretty cool because that's the part of the AFLC where um, if you want to do a short-term mission project, especially if you want to go to um, Brazil or Mexico where we have missionaries who need assistance and help, but lately also they've been taking trips to Israel. And so if, that's, if any of those places are places that you wanted to go, and uh, partly in some ways it's like a vacation, but it's a working vacation for ministry. Um, Journey Missions is who you want to work through and with on that. And so um, uh, I have the, I brought it up because I have the book for it downstairs on the harvest table if you want to look through and see what that's about. So, and the only other thing is I've had one person talk to me who won't be here for Thanksgiving, um, but they're going to work on writing out something that I'll be able to share, just sharing um, what they're thankful for for God. And I'm um, looking forward, hopefully, to other people who can have godly testimonies of things that they're thankful for. If you're not comfortable speaking, you can speak that day, uh, or you can uh, write something out or put down some notes and I can share. But talk to me. I would love Thanksgiving service to have a large component or the majority of it be us giving thanks for how God has blessed us, especially uh, in the world the way it is today. There's still God working, and we think of the Thanksgiving that we gave for Pat this morning and God that way. So be thinking of that, praying about that, and then follow up with me um, with what God lays on your heart that you, just, that you want us to appreciate and share and how he's worked in your life. All right, I think that's everything I have for today, other than, you know, the sermon later. Uh, any other announcements or prayer requests for us to be aware of? Yeah, Rich? Oh, yes, yeah, I'll include that in my prayers this morning. Yeah, we're... Um, definitely pray for the outcome of the election, basically. God already knows what that'll be, and uh, it's in his hands, and so we'll be keeping that in prayer this morning. All right, well, with that, I invite you to rise as you're able, and we'll begin our call to worship this morning in Psalm 149, printed for you in the bulletin. And you'll read responsibly with me. Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the godly.
Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Let the godly exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute on them the judgment of Britain, the dishonor of all its Praise the Lord. We continue in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for calling us together into your house this morning, Lord. Minister to our hearts and minds. Refresh our souls with your Holy Spirit as we bring worship and praise to you through our singing as we open your word and we listen to you speaking to us through your word this morning. May it mold and transform our lives into the image of Christ day by day, always growing closer and deeper with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Our opening hymn is Open My Eyes That I May See, number 124. Continue on page two in our hymnal with the confession of our sin before our God. Let us bow our hearts and minds before the Lord, confessing together. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake, grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Declaration of Grace this morning is a common one I use for Communion Sundays because it shares the dual reality. First and foremost, that Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given His only Son to die for us. The promise of Scripture is that whoever confesses his sins to the Lord will receive forgiveness through the faithfulness and righteousness of Jesus Christ. God grant that this may be the experience of us all. And on the other hand, I declare to the impenitent and the unbelieving that so long as they continue in their impenitence, God has not forgiven their sins and will assuredly visit their iniquities upon them if they do not turn from their evil ways and come to true repentance and faith in Christ before the day of grace ends. May we never take for granted the community that we have in Christ Jesus, which we celebrate this morning in communion, because he allows us to come to him and to one another with our sins forgiven and our shame gone. Congregation may be seated. We continue with our readings. Our first reading is from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, and yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he was turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send to you Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Egypt, the children of Israel out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you, that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Our second reading comes from 1 John 3, 1 through 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not been has not yet appeared but we know that when he appears we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure I invite the congregation to rise for our holy gospel lesson 
Our gospel lesson today comes from Luke chapter 20, beginning in verse 27. There came to Jesus some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children, and the second and the third took her, and likewise all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will that the woman be? For the seven had her as wife. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die any more, because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any question. We continue on page 18 in our hymnal with the confession of our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We confess together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, and then the Holy Spirit, Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Glory be to the Father. may be seated and invite the ushers to come forward at this time for our offering. I blame daylight savings time for all the, the kids <laughs> being frustrated this morning. Thank you guys.
Thank you for the many blessings you've bestowed upon us. Return these thank offerings that we give to you back to you and multiply them, use them to make your name glorified, to encourage your saints, and for us to be equipped in order to bring more people into a relationship with you. And speaking of the precious gifts you've given us, Lord, thank you for the children in our services. And we thank you so much for the life that we remember today as well, thinking of Trenton's birthday, and there was one time where he was a little toddler running around as well, and, and each of us, if we think back far enough, can remember those days, and as we get older, we, we maybe take for granted life and the, the days that we have. Lord, help us not to squander those gifts, and we ask, Lord, for your protection from our youngest to our oldest, guard our hearts and our minds, and lead us into deeper understanding and relationship with you, Lord, and Lord, we, we pray that you overcome the foolishness of man who thinks they can manipulate time and screw up schedules for people and affect people's lives and health. May, may the foolishness of our human pride be overcome by your wisdom, whether it's in time changes or in our upcoming elections and leadership in our communities, in our homes, in our schools. Lord, we pray that, that your wisdom be present, that your truth be ever with the people wherever they are found and whatever authority they have, whether it's over the, just themselves or others. It is only, the only hope we have is that people will turn to your word and to your guidance and your truth to, to know the right way, Lord. Bless us in that as we follow it and protect us from those who do not. And Lord, we pray that whatever the outcome is of the election coming this week, Lord, we pray that, that you are with us through that that you bless your people, that you protect your people and those who turn to you, Lord, and that you make it hard on those who ignore you or attack you in order that they might still be saved or returned from their ignorance into the truth. And help us to minister to those who are broken, who are lost, and who are just in the depth of their ignorance, know no better. Help us to have compassion and pity on them just as you did for us, O Lord. Help us to love our enemies as you did. Let us follow in your example, Lord. And Lord, I pray your blessing upon your faithful leaders in your congregations, whether they be on councils or especially those who, who lead and shepherd the flocks, Lord. And I think my heart goes out to, to Rod and the ministers to so many churches. I pray that you bring people alongside of him and Morris and, and people like Travis as well, our lay leaders in our congregations, Lord, that they are able to handle and minister your word and, and step in and fill, fill in where others are, have not yet been called to go. And Lord, we thank you for the calling of Pastor Nick Schultz to St. Olaf and Pakwana recently in his installation, Lord, and we pray that you bless his work there. And we pray and think of those churches that many of us know firsthand or even indirectly that do not have leaders and shepherds, Lord. We pray that the churches that are lacking that godly leadership, that they do not turn away or stray from your word or settle for trying to fill their leadership roles on their own, but instead that they lean on you for their understanding, Lord. And we pray especially for the churches that have already begun to compromise in truth in some ways. We think especially of our, our local ELCA churches and ask, Lord, that you bring good godly ministers to those, commun those churches and congregations that they might dive back into the word and be leaning on your truth and never stray from it, Lord. And help us as well to not falter as we step forward and help us in our truthfulness and in our strength of that foundation to be loving in our strength and to use our strength that is founded in you, Lord, for good and not evil, to build up and not destroy. And Lord, we pray for thanksgiving for Pat's healing in her back and that you continue to minister to her and pray for, and, and be with her in her recovery. Give her the strength she needs to get through each day and help her back to get stronger and stronger each day. 
and we're thankful for her gratitude to you and to others as you minister to her through this time. And thank you for Larry, her faithful husband at her side, always helping along the way, Lord. And we thank you for his role in helping churches and pulpits as well where the where need comes up. And Lord, we ask that you be with Mildred. And we are so thankful for the attitude that you've given to her through her life and, and, and administered to her that it just shines that even in her struggles and even when she's in uh, pain and struggling, Lord, she, she doesn't hide it to prevent people from helping her, but she hides it because her hope and her strength and her attitude is founded upon the blessing that you gave her that she woke up today and that she is here, uh, not with us physically today, but in spirit. And so, Lord, we ask that you minister to her where she is right now in the hospital and that you continue to provide her comfort and peace through the days of of figuring out uh, her treatments and recovery in her back pain. And be with John as well as he continues to recover, Lord, and bless him in his recovery and his upcoming future surgery on his other knee. And Lord, whatever else is on our hearts and minds of a, a physical nature, I think of my, my situation as well, Lord, uh, provide hope, provide peace, provide comfort and healing and understanding. Help us not to worry about the future that has not happened. And help us not to dwell in the past, but to live in the present for your glory. And we share now in this moment of silence anything else that is burdening our hearts so that, that is joyful we need to share with you, Lord. We know that you hear us now as we cry out from our hearts and minds to you now. Lord, we thank you for the the strength and the peace and the faithfulness you demonstrate to us in your fatherhood over us. Help us to be your loving children. Give us the guidance that we need. And as well, help us to endure the correction that we need from time to time also. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation may be seated. We continue our service with this little light of mine, number 359. You have permission to do the actions, too, if you would like. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Won't that Satan put it out? I'm gonna let it shine. Hopefully that gave you some joy this morning. If nothing, I like to make sure the kids feel included every now and then too. I always feel bad whenever I like mention or bring it up when they're, you know, they're a little noisy this morning, understandably so, their schedule's an hour off, and, and I hope it never comes across as like uh, not liking them or judgmental, because 
Uh, we have awesome kids in this church, and we have awesome church that celebrates and loves kids. And there are many churches throughout our nation that don't have any kids in them, and that's, that breaks my heart. And so I hope you never take that uh, awkwardly or judgmentally. As a matter of fact, this morning, Micah was making some of the noise. And so uh, uh, we're all in that same boat, you know, and it's probably better than the older people making noises because those are less pleasant. So uh, pray with me, please, as we begin. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And, and as we had joy in singing that song and, and, and even including ourselves with our kids and singing it and seeing the smiles on faces, uh, may, we, may we draw that from your word today, a reminder of the joyfulness we have being the holy ones of God because of Jesus Christ, because you bestowed that to us. You gave us value and you demonstrate value to us. Help us to dwell in that this morning as we open your word and examine it for our lives and and help us to understand well what does that mean in application how do we apply that then in our lives to ourselves and to others keep these things in our hearts and minds through your holy spirit this morning lord in jesus name we pray amen so it's always weird for me like last week it was easy to do reformation sunday because like reformation was literally the next day you know and and uh uh but All Saints Day, technically this is All Saints Sunday, but that was like all the way back to Tuesday, which, you know, this time of year, pastors are already thinking about Christmas and the New Year, and, you know, let alone going back five or six days to All Saints Day. But um, it, there, was, there was one of the, a pastor friend of mine, though, shared, shared something on Facebook that I thought was interesting for us to remember when considering uh, Halloween and All Saints, and it went this way. It said, the day after Halloween is All Saints Day. And so, so on Halloween, we say to death, we are not afraid of you. And on All Saints Day, we say, see, all these people weren't afraid of death either. Because it's the day, it's the time of the church year where we remember the, the saints who have gone before us. All those who have died in Christ Jesus, who are now the holy ones of God, washed in the blood of the Lamb. And they're fully known, and they're fully pure, and they're fully perfected. And we're going to look at some of what that means today. And we're looking at the, the two passages we're focusing on, our, our gospel text, our Luke passage, um, but also our First John 3 through 1 through 3 passage. So uh, if you want to have those handy as we go through there. And then thinking of, of our kids this morning as well, another thing that was appropriately that I reshared on Facebook this week. When church, when church, um, well, use the word church. I'm going to change that to when, when the congregation, when the gathering of God's people, when that becomes optional to people, it will become unnecessary to their children. And we've just seen that in the culture. People have made coming together, especially in the last couple of years where people are just separated in so many ways, politically or, or because of disease or whatever else. They're separated um, because of the internet. They don't, you know, you know you have deeper relationships with people halfway around the world than you do with neighbors. And it's, and it's like, it's such a sad state that when people neglect or think it's just an option to come together and to break bread with one another and to, to physically touch and hug and shake hands and, and to talk face to face with one another, when that becomes optional, the next generation is just going to be lost. And the generation after that, well, it's just, you can write them off. And we, we just see the results of that already. So that's the bummer we'll start out with, I suppose, for the day. And it's under that, that, you, that attitude of that, really, that, that comes from the culture, is when we see the Sadducees come into Jesus to, to, to ask him questions. And, and this is from a section of Luke, and, and likewise, when you see these sections in Matthew and Mark also, you have groups of people come into Jesus, and they're attacking him indirectly through their debate, through their questions, by trying to trip him up and trying to make him look foolish and bad so that they can gloat. We see that all the time in the news and in debates and stuff like that, um, where people defend those who are, aren't worth defending or they attack those who are trying to do their best not to make mistakes that people will jump on. And so that's what we see here. The, the Pharisees are the one group that we talk about a lot. They were the ones that were like the whole Bible was their, 
the, the, for them, the Old Testament, but like all of it mattered, and, and they would add things to it, and they were, they were what you would call your, your conservatives in the church, in a way, in the synagogues. And the Sadducees that we're focusing on today, they were a little bit more of the, the, the liberals, the rational ones. They would try to use their reason. And, they, and this is important because of our, our Exodus passage that's referenced today, um, but also in, in this Luke passage that refers back to it. They, they only kind of focused on the Moses part. All the additional stuff from the Old Testament, they, they, didn't, they didn't go to that additional stuff. They, they really kind of just clung to the base commandments and the, the, the instructions of Moses. They kind of went back to that and they would reason out of that instead. And in that way, it allowed them to kind of add in more. Um, and, and we would call them, com comparably to our current culture, we would call them more of the, the liberal church type mindset. How could they justify themselves and, and, and believe what they wanted to believe? They didn't believe in resurrection of the dead and, and they didn't believe the more spiritual truths of God. And we see that a lot in our culture today where people live for the current time in the current age that we're in and they see this life as all there is and then they add a little bit of the Christian faith into that. There's your Sadducees. And so they're coming to Jesus trying to attack him on the question of is there a resurrection from the dead. They, they already come at it with the assumption and belief that there is not. And they are basing that on, the, on their understanding of Moses and their understanding of their biblical instructions. So to put that bluntly and to help us understand, and I said this yesterday at the men's breakfast, and I'll say this often in the pulpit in different ways, but we want to understand, in a way, the Sadducees, they were the enemy. So how do we love the enemy in that case? And I want us to understand that in their ignorance, they just don't know. Yeah, they're attacking Jesus, they're an enemy. We should have compassion for them as Jesus did. He didn't attack them. He didn't turn on them. He presented them the truth. He, he answered their question, which you could say maybe from their point of view was antagonistic, but they responded well, which we'll get to as well at the end. But the reality is he didn't ignore them. He went to them. He went to the Pharisees. He went to the, the Sadducees. He went to the Jews. He went to God's people because he loved them and they were enemies of God in their ignorance. And he didn't want them destroyed. He wanted them saved. And so we see this as a demonstration of that. Maybe that will help us understand our, our, our political opponents, those who think differently than us, whatever side that might be, and it might be in the middle even, or whether they're, they're antagonistic at a workplace, or even in our households, if it's a husband and spouse trying to decide how to raise the kids and there's disagreement, that we understand that the other person isn't evil, they just think differently or they have different ideas or they're lacking knowledge and truth. And so our first thing should be to engage and try to understand, okay, what are they thinking? So Jesus already knew, as I've already laid out for you, that, and, and Luke says as well, these are people that deny the resurrection. They're asking a question of Jesus that makes him have to directly address that. And it's speaking also, it wraps in the idea of marriage. And you'll note on a side note from our current cultural issues that it's purely a wife and seven different men, but it was always a husband and wife. Never was she going out and having another wife or anything like that. Demonstrating God's model, God's rule, God's dictate to reality, husband and wife is the design for the world that we live in. And so in verse 28, they ask him, Teacher, Moses wrote for us, if a man's brother dies having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow, raise up the offspring for his brother. Now the reality of this, the reason for this was because of the, the nation of Israel, those who wrestled with God, God's people, were a physical nation on the world at that time. God was physically their king and he had these rules and part of these rules were for their, their heritage to be passed on, for their tribe to be known. They were all named and numbered and a lot of that was for who owned land and kind of similar to the farmlands around here, right? We really love when those are kept in the family. We're really saddened when they're bought by a corporation or somebody who doesn't even live in the state. It's that kind of thing. They wanted to make sure that there was, there was purity passed on and so this was a, uh, one of these more more national laws, not like a moral law, that, that the, the, the family would keep the, the connectedness. We saw that a little bit with Ruth and Naomi uh, when her daughter-in-laws, um, when both of Naomi's sons had died, 
you know, she, she kind of goes on like, well, I don't have any other sons for you to marry to keep in the family that way. And, and so then she tried to send them off. It's that same kind of idea. The, the, the reality that God is demonstrating for us, the importance of family, the importance of marriage, the importance of, of the connectedness of the body of, of, of Christ in our instance, but in that case, the nation of God and those who struggle with God. But again, the Sadducees, they're the type that get caught up in the, like, well, here's this, here's this uh, scenario that is unrealistic to ever happen, but if this scenario happened, what would it be? And so the, the, the wife has the seven brothers as husbands. And when it speaks of that, it means there, there, through the physical unions, there was no children provided. And so it is a good question for us to consider, right? Because we think about that. When, when we marry... And when, when our spouses die or when, our, when we think of losing both of our parents and, and our grandparents and, and we think of <laughs> my son falling off the pew, oh my God, another bruise. But when we think of, when we think of those losses, right, what, don't we think about like, well, when, when, uh, when we die and we get to heaven, we're going to be reunited with them. And, and it's like, yeah, there's truth in that. All those who die in Christ will be reunited in Christ. But we don't be reunited into the same relationships, and we're going to look at that a little bit more when we get to Jesus' response. But these, the Sadducees are trying to pin down, like, well, who, who is she going to be married to in heaven? Who is she going to, you know, go pal up with in heaven and say, hey, this is my husband? And, and, and the reality is, heaven won't be anything like that. Marriage is given in this world, and we see this even in the creation, when, when Adam is, is lonely and Eve is provided as a, a helpmate, it's, it's deeper than, it's not a slave, it's not a, a household helper, she's not a maid, she's not a, it, it's, a, it's a, a, a partner in the marriage and family relationship that a husband and wife are. And that is meant for this age. Because God has set that up in this age because we need help. And we need the help of the Lord as well and the help of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it on our own. We can't make ourselves holy or right. We can't keep ourselves pure. We can't keep ourselves from saying or thinking or doing the wrong things. We all know that. I could ask for examples. I'm sure some spouses would love to share from time to time. Every now and then I get to hear examples. But we'd, this isn't the place for airing those things because God forgives those things and makes us holy. But we can't do that ourselves, which is a main point today in thinking of saints that way. But the reality is, right, we... we in this age, when we lose somebody significant to us, especially a spouse, that's deeply painful. But in the next age, all that pain will be gone, and not because we will be with that spouse again, but because we'll be with Jesus. So Jesus' response, verse 34, Jesus says to them, the sons, and we could say by extension as well, the, the sons and daughters of this age, those who live in this age, they marry and they are given in marriage. And that's a reality. That's a good thing. It's a blessing that God has given us. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead, now he's referring to those who go to the next age, the eternal age that we would say, in our case, we would say either heaven or hell. And specifically, those who are resurrected from the dead, brought back to life. These are the, these are the realities of what that will be like. They won't, they won't marry nor will they be given in marriage because the purpose for marriage will be gone. Marriage is that thing that provides us comfort, it provides us help, it provides us the ability to get through our lives in, in a different way, a deeper way beyond loneliness sometimes. And while it may not be for everybody in this age, it is a blessing that God has bestowed and it has a specific purpose and that purpose will no longer be needed in the heavenly realm because God will be fulfilling that perfectly. Everybody will be fully made saints and no longer sinners through Jesus Christ and through the resurrection of the dead. And additionally, verse 36, they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels. Angels being a created being of God. The angels are not multiplying and growing in number. There were a finite number of angels. God made them. Their angel literally means messenger or and basically, they're the agents of God that go to and from the world. And the ones who rejected God, such as Lucifer and the fallen angels, and the one, they, be, they are the demons in the world 
the evil spirits. And praise the Lord, there's a limited number of them as well. But they do not, they do not die. They are, not, they are created beings, but they're not humans. But we will be equal to them in the resurrection because we will no longer will die at that point. And there are other verses in the Bible that speak to that reality. And they are, we are not the angels, but we, the resurrected beings, the ones through the blood in Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection, have become and will become, Jesus is speaking in the future here, sons of God. And again, this isn't exclusive to men. We can apply this to women validly through the language. We will be sons and daughters of God. And we will be sons of the resurrection, sons and daughters of the resurrection. Well, what is a son or a daughter, right? It's a, a child comes forth from the parents. There's that connectedness to the parents. The, connect, the parents are the source. God will be the source of all his people. And that they will also be sons and daughters of the resurrection, the new life. They will be born in that. They will come forth from out of that. These are the truths of the reality of the future. Jesus is declaring these future truths and describing the reality of, of an aspect of what heaven will be like. And heaven, heaven isn't like this, this place with a cloud. You sit on with a harp. That's a, a worldly man idea. Nothing of that is in the Bible. Heaven is about more about the presence of God and the relationship of God and the community and connectedness of the body of Christ. And this speaks to that reality. It speaks of the family nature of God. Not the broken, sinful families we see in this world, but the perfect family of God, the sons and daughters of God, no longer suffering and wrestling with God and struggling, but made pure and holy in God. And living the resurrection from the dead. They will no longer be separated from life. They will have life fulfilled. God is the complete source of life and fulfills that. There will be no more death. So verse 37, we continue on. He says, but that the dead are raised, even Moses showed. So now he's directly, he declared truth and is declaring, which to us is a comfort, right? The fact that there will be no more death one day. There will be no more separation from God. We'll all be in his family. Those are great truths and comforts for the Christian. For the one who God is their father, their master, their servant, their <coughs> their Lord and Savior. Now he's going to directly speak to the Sadducees from where their understanding is, from where their ignorance is. And so he appeals to their authority, which is also God's authority because Moses represents and shares God's truth as well. And he speaks to them out of that. But the dead are raised, even Moses showed. In the passage about the bush, which Donna read this morning, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He doesn't say the God who was of Abraham or anything of the past tense. It's a living and active language. And even, even when God is addressing Abraham from the bush, I am is my name, a very active God. We speak of God being living and active. There's no nature of God that is ever dead other than the death and resurrection of Christ through his taking on our sin debt. Jesus says, now he is not God. God is not the God of the dead. The God who revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, reveals himself to us, especially now in the form of the Son, Jesus Christ. He is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. So we have Jesus declaring future truth and reality that we look forward to pleasantly. And then now here also he's declaring a reminder of past truth that had been neglected. He appealed to their own authority and said, hey, this is what you're saying you believe, and yet you say you, you don't believe in the resurrection. Those ideas, they're, they're in conflict. In much the same way that somebody may say, well, you say you believe in God and you trust in God's truth and revelation and the Bible, but you believe in evolution, they're in conflict. You can't mesh them together because one contradicts the other when you apply them to each other. Whether it's the resurrection or evolution or abortion or think of any other ideas, if we bring them into the, if we compare them to the Bible, if there's a conflict that has to be resolved, 
And a resolution must always come from God's truth. And the, the wisdom of God's truth, the goodness of it, just as that little light shined when we sang before our hymn or before our sermon, that, that wisdom of God's truth, it shines brightly and it is evident even to the most ignorant or deceived and dark. And we see that in verse 39. Because then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well. They recognized the authority of his speaking, the truth of his speaking, the wisdom of it, the knowledge of it. It was obvious to them. So then it became a burden. Now, and this is a struggle for us today as well. What do we do with that truth when we see it? And there's only two options. We run from it and hide it and, and, and we, we, we deceive ourselves and we see that in the culture. Or we repent and we turn back to it and we submit to it and we get better through that process. In the case of verse 40, it said, For they no longer dared to ask Jesus any questions. He had silenced his opponents. Our first John 3, 1 through 3 passage, and we'll wrap up here quickly here. John declares to us the reality of what we've been talking about that's been fulfilled through Christ and what we celebrate when we think of All Saints Day. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. And so it's, it's awesome to see God's love demonstrated that allows us to say, I'm a child of God. When we were baptized in His name, we became His children spiritually. And when we come into his presence weekly or we open his word and we pray, we're growing in relationship with him. We're being made holy. We're being made set apart from the world and we're being brought into his, into his household. We're being set on his knee and he's ministering to us and he's talking to us. And that should be great comfort to us. When, we, when we're not sure about our salvation, we're struggling to think that we're valuable, that should be a comfort to us. That should give us peace in our minds. You think of love, joy, peace, patience, you know, the goodness and faithfulness, the fruit of the Spirit that way. That's where it comes from. It comes from that knowledge that we are children of God through what God has done, not through anything we earned or did. And then the other reality is that also earns us sometimes scorn and shame, persecution, because the, the world does not know him and it does not know us if we are with him. And therefore, we get attacked, we get ignored, we get shoved aside in the culture. Don't let that defeat you. Paul got stoned. Stephen was stoned to death. Many of the people were persecuted. People that brought us the word of God burned at the stake just for translating God's word so people could see it and hear it. It's because the world did not know them. The only way to stand up and fight that attack properly is to let the world know who he is, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. To let them know, hey, we are God's children and he wants to adopt you as well. Let me introduce you to him and then the work is between God and them. And that's all that God asks of us. Verse 2, beloved, we are God's children now. Take comfort and delight in that. You are the holy ones of God. But at the same time, we still struggle because we're still in this age. Already we are sons and daughters of God, but yet at the same time, it's not quite yet fully fulfilled until he appears again. And, and what we will be has not yet appeared. Our pure form, our good form, our holy form will be made known when he appears. We shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. We'll see him purely as well. And everyone who thus hopes in Jesus Christ, thus hopes in God their creator and savior, purifies himself as he is pure. It's not anything we say or do or think that purifies us. It's purely the hope and the work that he has done. The faith the trust, the belief we have in God, that's what makes us holy because it's that's on his work. That is, that's where the freedom comes in Christ. 
because we don't have that burden to bear. He takes that burden from us. I pray that that's a comfort to us today and that we come up joyfully to communion because we can, because we've been freed that way. And I pray that that joy goes with us into the world as it attacks us and shames us, that we not take it personally because it's atta- the world is attacking and shaming God, not us. And may that bring us to have compassion on them, that we might share with them why we have the good news we have, why we have the joy we have, why we can have the, the good attitude that we have even when we're suffering in deep pain or loss. So take that to heart this morning. We'll pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, let us never forsake your word and your relationship. Help us to draw strength from you, from our connectedness with you. Heal us in mind, body, and spirit that we may be strong enough to go and do your work in the world. That when we enter your, your holy presence one day, when you return, that we may do so with the friends and the enemies that we turned into friends by being faithful to your truth and to your, your, your gospel, your good news, that you died and rose again for us and for everyone, even our worst enemies. May we have the compassion that you had so that our, our hearts will be as good and light as yours was and not darkened by hatred or anger. Bless us as we Do our best in that, Lord, to lead our children as well and our grandchildren and any of those who follow after us into your life and your understanding and your truth. Help us with your spirit to accomplish these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our service continues with the song, Because He Lives, number 545.
continue our service on page six with our communion part of the service. <clears throat> Dear friends in Christ, in order that you may receive this holy sacrament in a worthy manner, you should carefully consider what you must now believe and do. From the words of Christ, this is my body which is given for you. This is my blood which is shed for you for the remission of sins. You should believe that Jesus Christ is present with his body and blood, as the words declare. From Christ's words for the remission of sins, you should also believe that Jesus gives to you his body and blood to strengthen your assurance that your sins are forgiven. And finally, you should do as Christ commands you when he says, Take, eat, drink of it, all of you. This do in remembrance of me. If you believe these words of Christ and do as he has commanded, then you have properly examined yourselves and may eat Christ's body and drink his blood in a worthy manner. You should also unite in giving thanks to Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for so great a gift and should love one another with a pure heart and thus with the whole Christian church have comfort and joy in Christ our Lord. To this end, may God the Father give you his grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue with the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on a night he was betrayed, took bread, and after blessing and giving thanks for it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. This do as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after he had supped, he took the cup, and after blessing and giving thanks for it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink. This cup is a new testament of my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins and for many. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. are prepared, you can come forward at the direction of the ushers, you may be seated.
I'd invite the congregation to rise as we close in prayer. We thank you, almighty, everlasting God, for having refreshed us with these, your gracious gifts. And we ask for your infinite mercy. Strengthen our Christian faith, support us in the trials of life, and make us fervent in our love for you and to our fellow men. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Receive now the benediction of the Lord. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his almighty and everlasting peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. peace and serve the Lord. And we'll sing happy. You, can, you may be seated, but we'll sing happy birthday to Trenton now so you guys can have cake. You going to play it? Okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Trenton. Happy birthday to you. You're welcome.